Well, uh, yeah, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, Harry invited me to teach this class. I want to thank Harry and said, what's the topic? And he said, the topic is, is Jesus. So I love it when you get a, just a narrow, you know, small topic uh, to work with. Uh, this is, I think, maybe the first or second in this series. We just call the radical alternative. So uh, uh, anyway, we will, uh, I think we can do it an hour, don't you? Jesus okay. in an hour. So, uh, well, to, to get started, uh, why don't we just, you know what the Quakers call centering down, uh, just uh, quiet our minds and uh, take a few breaths, and I'll lead us in an opening prayer. So let us get in. O oh God, whose ways are more loving than our ways, and whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Like Jesus' first disciples, we're slow to understand. So help us in this hour to see anew your glory shining in the person of Jesus, to the end that we may follow in the way of Jesus as his thankful and faithful disciples. In his name we pray, amen. Well, as you can see from your handout, and by the way, those of you online, uh, I think have a link to the handout. Uh, so the topic is, who is Jesus for us today? And it reminds me of uh, a question Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, kept asking German uh, 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 Christians, uh, not just who is Jesus, but uh, as if there was one universal answer for all times, but who is Jesus for us today? Bonhoeffer asked in the midst of the rise of Nazi Germany and the persecution and suffering of the Jews, who is Jesus for us you know, today? So I, guess I want us to emphasize that as we, as we think about, about that, our own, our own situation. Uh, so... Uh, uh, our sort of passage today is Mark 8, 27 through 34. It's also in Matthew 16 and, and Luke 9. Uh, before reading that passage, just a couple of uh, kind of background uh, uh, comments about how or where Mark sets this passage in, in his gospel. Uh, the first thing is this is the first of the three passion predictions uh, when Jesus uh, pr predicts, announces his suffering and death. Uh, up until this point, Jesus in Mark's gospel has never mentioned his death, even though, you know, this, you might say there's been some foreshadowing in his baptism, in John the Baptist's execution, in the, in the uh, uh, opposition that Jesus has received. But this is the first time in Mark's gospel that Jesus mentions uh, his suffering and death uh, and rejection. Uh, the other thing to mention, uh, just as background, is that this passage comes, sort of, is said in the midst of the disciples' ongoing <laughs> confusion and misunderstanding uh, about who Jesus is. Uh, so for example, uh, the, uh, the verses just prior to, to, today's, uh, to today's reading, uh, so the disciples have, Jesus has just fed the 5,000, they've gotten in the boat, got to the other side, and the disciples say, uh, you know, hey, we forgot the picnic. Uh, say, we, we, have no, we have no bread. Uh, and being aware of it, Jesus said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Have you eyes that do not see and having ears that do not hear? Uh, and he kept saying to them, do you not understand? Now, I think that, at least for me, that's the question keeps reverberating down. Uh, I, would, I sometimes think if Jesus spoke to me, he might say, do you not yet understand? So that's the uh, proceeds today's passage. And then just after that, uh, in chapter 9, they came to Capernaum. And when he, when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they were silent. They're silent because they're embarrassed. 
uh, because they were discussing uh, uh, with one another uh, who was the greatest. So, you know, do you not yet understand? Not that we had those thoughts. Uh, <laughs> you know, who's the prettiest? Who's the most intelligent? Or who's the wisest? Uh, so, and then, and then in chapter 10, uh, another conversation, uh, uh, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, uh, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, you know, one at your right hand and one at your left when you come into your glory. Now, in other words, you know, Jesus is about to come into Jerusalem and establish establishes his kingdom and set up his rule. They're saying, we want the chief cabinet position. You know, again, you know, do you not understand? Uh, uh, we never do that today, do we? You know, who's the, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, we want positions of authority, we want to be recognized, we want to be acknowledged, uh, all, all these things. Uh, do, do you not yet uh, understand? So anyway, that's sort of the context for today's passage, uh, this confusion and misunderstanding um, about just about just who Jesus is. So with that, uh, let's read. By the way, the I got I gave a handout mainly just for the purpose of <laughs> since this topic is so bad, just more or less trying to keep us uh, a little bit uh, focused. So Mark Mark a, uh, I would contend uh, uh, that this may be one of the most important passages in Mark's gospel in terms of understanding the whole gospel. And, uh, and, and our uh, vocation as disciples. Uh, and Jesus uh, went on with his disciples to the village of the Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked the disciples, well, who do people say that I am? And he told them, uh, and they told him, uh, John the Baptist, the others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And Jesus charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the priests and the scribes and be killed. And after that, after three days, rise again. And he, he said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. And he called to him the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If any person would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So, you know, the first thing I thought we might look at is uh, where does this uh encounter between Jesus and the disciples <clears throat> take place because often probably not, not always but often in the gospels uh, the setting can help illuminate uh, the meaning of the text so did you did you notice where where this particular encounter is set yeah Caesarea Philippi right and um I went there a number of several years ago with a seminary group. It's a beautiful spot, uh, waterfalls, and there's a cave to the to the uh, pagan god Pan, and now just ruins. But of course, Caesarea refers to Caesar, particularly Caesar Augustus. Philippi, Philip was Herod the Great's son, and continued the building uh, of the temple of the Caesarea Philippi. So, in that location, there were a, a, a kind of a, a a number of temples. Uh, uh, to Caesar Augustus with the main temple, beautiful white temple with the big uh, columns, uh, other other temples there. Uh, so uh, this sort of was the setting uh, of uh, uh, for um, uh, for uh, for this text. And uh, uh, you know the the titles uh, like uh, Son of God, uh, God from God, uh, Savior of the world. Uh, liberator, divine, those were in use uh, in this day, uh, uh, that is applied to Caesar Augustus. So uh, just picture the, the juxtaposition 
of, uh, here's Jesus, the itinerant rabbi from Nazareth. They're a ragtag group of, uh, of fishermen and other folks uh, in the back, in the setting of this impressive array of Roman uh, domination, godlike uh, earthly rulers, uh, military power, uh, all right there before these disciples. And it's in that location that Jesus asked, uh, okay, who, what are people, who are people saying that I am? So is uh, Sisteria of Philippi in Lebanon? No, it's, as I remember, it's really on the northern border of Israel. So it's, it's kind of a borderland, uh, northern Galilee. Um, well, you know, before we get that question, who are people saying that I am? How would we locate ourselves today? I, I'm not thinking uh, particularly about geographical location, but what is our location for hearing the gospel? I mean, the, the, the historical, political, religious uh, 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 setting uh, uh, for you know, hearing that question, who is Jesus for us? Today, oh, have you uh, your thoughts about how would you describe, you know, where we are? Two extremes, I think, Sam. Kind <laughs> of a time of extremes. Yeah, you know, it's interesting when I um, a few weeks ago, month two ago, Jan and I were at Chautauqua, New York. Some of you uh, maybe know about the Chautauqua Institute. I know Harry. Uh, knows about that, but we were uh, we were there for their for their week, and I was on my way to the Hall of Philosophers when I got Harry's uh, email and looked at it, and he invited me to teach this class on the subject of Jesus. And when I was got that email, I was on my way to hear a, a lecture by a Tibetan Buddhist, and I just thought that was interesting uh, that we whoever Jesus is for us today. Uh, it's, it's in this multi-faith, you know, uh, uh, context. And how do we understand who Jesus is in this, uh, you know, multi-faith and no faith uh, kind of uh, time? Mm. I, I know this is playing out in the in the Catholic Church. Uh, I just saw in the paper a couple weeks ago the uh, Pope defies advice of bishops and attends interfaith conference. And as you know, Pope. Uh, Pope Francis has been kind of very open to other faiths and seeking commonality and all of us working together for peace. But uh, and there's bishops and cardinals saying, no, this is muddying the water. We're losing, uh, 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 we're losing kind of the, the uh, uncertainty of Jesus uh, is for us. The salvation is uh, only through the Catholic Church. So, you know, who is Jesus in this sort of pluralism, pluralistic religious setting? Is is Jesus uh, kind of an open door, a bridge uh, to other faiths? Is Jesus bigger than any denomination uh, or faith? Or as some of the Catholic bishops, I know other Christians, uh, they know Jesus, Jesus is exclusively ours. So uh, anyway, that's just one, I think, kind of location for us. This is the interfaith world uh, in which we live. Yeah. It's very unsettling for me, Dan. I just... I think having grown up in such a, uh, a, I mean, I was Southern Baptist. And so you grow up, you think that Jesus is God and there is, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's really unsettling for me to like, uh, you know, I think he either is or he wasn't. And mm -hmm. if he isn't, then isn't the whole Bible a lie? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I keep grappling mm -hmm. with in my mind of, of trying to understand uh, just really what does that mean and, right. and how much truly I, I think I'm incapable of understanding God. I mean, how many of us can take that in? I don't think the brightest person I know can't really take that in. <laughs> and, so it, and I'm sure it's that yeah, 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 yeah. But it is really... Uh, I don't know other another word. It's just very confusing mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. I just yeah. I feel like the word of God's the word of God, or it isn't. And if mm -hmm. it isn't, then it does. I might as well go read, you know, mm -hmm. like Rumi or somebody. That yeah. would be yeah. just because there's great positive stuff in sure. there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you. Mary. Actually, we're gonna I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. I thank you for for, for raising that. I mean, 
Yeah, go ahead, George. I think uh, where we are is somewhat illustrated in where you said you were when you got the message. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Chicago was originally a uh, very, well, I say the word fundamentalist uh, with quotations around yeah. because uh, it was fairly broad in terms of denominational uh, input, but it was originally a camp meeting. Yeah, for Methodist. For evangelistic mm -hmm. service. That's right, yeah. Uh, and now you're heading to a session there that has nothing to do with the camp meeting agenda, mm -hmm. but more to do with expanding our understanding of right. the religious, um, religious and ethical and moral compass. Right. Of our yeah, that's true. Yeah, Chautauqua very much embraces that. And that really I think that um, both of those comments indicate that this is the way it's all been. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm looking at Occupy territory too, like the Romans Occupy Palestine, but also um, very pluralistic, obviously. I mean, there were, you know, temples to unknown gods, there were temples to the pantheon of gods. I think it's always been. Confusing and complicated. Yeah, yeah, always. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely true. And I guess with our global media, so it seems a little more intense, but your eyes always, it's always been there. Jesus' first disciples. So, okay. um, you all thought I have another sort of location for us today. I thought in trying to understand the gospel is the uh, environmental crisis uh, that, we, that we face. And I was, was thinking that, you know, uh, kind of not maybe not in response to that, but as a part of that, a kind of expansion of our understanding of our faith, uh, you know, sort of traditionally or for the most part, redemption or salvation, whatever word we use, has primarily applied to human beings. Uh, you know, uh, we thought of it in that terms. And now with the crisis in the earth, there's been a kind of an opening to thinking more broadly about redemption of all of creation and how we all belong and, and relate together. Um, I thought of, you know, I know Harry uh, is good friends with John Philip Newell. And I think he's been been to this church, I believe. Uh, but his book, Sacred Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul, is just kind of, uh, he's right from a Celtic kind of spirituality part, but that all of earth, the earth is sacred. We need to get in touch with the sacredness of all people and, and the earth. I know last Sunday, uh, the uh, elder from the Hamas Pueblo, Bro, uh, Brophy Toledo, I think, was here. And a couple weeks ago, I did a hike with him in the Caja del Rio, and he kept talking about the earth people and the interconnectedness of all creatures, you know, four-legged, two-legged, winged, gilled, pollinators, that we all belong together. So uh, I don't know, just mention that in, in this in our day, the, the sort of climate crisis or catastrophe sort of awakens this sense of who is Jesus in terms of, of all of this. And does Jesus, uh, our faith in him, have something to do with uh, not just human salvation, but, but salvation of all creation? Um, you know, one other thing, don't want to go, we could keep going on with this, but. Uh, you know, who is Jesus for us in this radical kind of vision that we're experiencing within our faith and within society of, of uh, the, the kind of alarming rise of Christian nationalism? Uh, uh, I remember on January 6th watching the riots and seeing a very, I thought, a very disturbing sign as people were going over the barricades and beating the police and going into the Capitol. Three flags there flying, a Confederate flag, uh, a Trump flag, and flag that said Jesus. You know, so who is Jesus in this time of uh, rising Christian nationalism and uh, all these things? So that's part of our environment, part of our context. Uh, so anybody want to mention uh, uh, anything else? Like I say, there's certainly a lot there. <laughs> a lot there. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, I think it's the plurality is a context in which we have to make decisions. Do I believe every jot and tittle of the New Testament? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
but in a, in a uh, metaphoric, not necessarily literal, not necessarily literally. And the uh, the the point is, I have to make a decision how I discern or I believe it. Mm -hmm. the plurality that we're living in. Means there's not, and that was Jesus's own situation. Mm -hmm. He was in a plurality, right, and he was recovering uh, key points out of Judaism, yes, or what it means to understand to be a human being, right? Yeah, yeah. That kind of moves us a bit into the, the sort of the question Jesus asking in light of kind of. Uh, context and where we are. Said, well, who, who, what's the gospel? What's the buzz? Who, who are people saying that I am? Uh, and remember the what 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 they said. Uh, well, you're uh, some say you're John, John the Baptist, or others uh, Elijah, or still others one of the prophets. And you know, I think first of all, those are not bad answers. Uh, that everybody, there's some kind of disagreement about it, but everybody identified Jesus with the prophetic tradition of Israel. So that's interesting that, you know, he, I think in some way, was continuing the ministry of John the Baptist. John came to set the crooked places straight and uh, to declare God's justice and peace. And if you have two coats and your neighbor has none, give, give one to your neighbor. If you have food and the person is hungry, you know, give them food. Jesus came, remember his announcement of ministry, I, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Uh, uh, I've been anointed to preach the good news to the poor, recovering a sight to the blind and so forth. So the fact that Jesus is identified in this prophetic tradition of Israel, I think was a pretty good answer. Um, and, uh, but the, uh, 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 the other thing I was going to point out about their answer though, is that there, there was some diversity of opinion. <laughs> you know, even then, well, John the Baptist, but some are saying uh, Elijah, others are saying one of the other prophets. And so, you know, from the beginning, there was never a single answer who, who Jesus is. Uh, and this is illustrated by the Gospels. We don't have just one Gospel, but four Gospels in the canon. A lot, lot, they share a lot in common, but there are some pretty significant differences there too. And as you all know, in the first few centuries, there was uh, a kind of a number of other gospels written, very different pictures of Jesus in those early centuries. So, uh, you know, not everybody agreed. So, yeah, I think uh, one of the major roles that Jesus plays, even in our contemporary society, is it makes people think twice about what's important. Uh, there's the world values, and then there's the values that we get from the New Testament. And if we don't think twice, if we just think as being in the world, then we go down a path that where we miss the boat. Yeah. Absolutely. What else? Um, um, this kind of diversity of diversity of opinion, uh, and uh, uh, in the we saw from the beginning, and certainly still still continues. Uh, what else? What are you all hearing? And what are other people, in our society and around, saying about Jesus? Uh, you know, what do you hear? No, I'm saying about this. I thought, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. I'm not paying attention to the it's people online. It's, go ahead. Hmm, maybe I, anyway. Uh, I was going to say, you know, one of the things I hear most often is Jesus is an everyday cuss word. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but you can't watch it. It's very difficult to watch a contemporary drama or a movie or something on TV without hearing Jesus' name used over and over and over as profanity. So, you know, what does that mean? Uh, but that's what I, one thing, one of the things that, that I hear. Uh, you know, uh, uh, another thing that we hear a lot, um, I think Harriet preached a sermon on Diane Butler Bass's book, Freeing Jesus, uh, said rediscovering Jesus as friend, teacher, savior, Lord, way, and, and presence. 
But she says that thing I'd say we, uh, in her introduction that we hear a lot. Uh, she said, uh, during this uh, year, recent years, millions of Americans have left the church behind. Probably many more have left emotionally and countless others are wondering if they should. One of the most consistent things I hear from people who have left, those doubting their faith and those just hanging on, is that the church or Christianity has failed them, wounded them, betrayed them, maybe just bored them, and they do not want to have much to, to do with it any longer. They're not unlike the novelist Anne Rice, who in 2010 declared, I quit being a Christian, I, I'm out. I remain committed to Christ and always, uh, uh, as always, but not to being Christian or being part of Christianity. Uh, she's not the first to make this negative confession, nor was she the last. It's a common refrain these, in these days, uh, times. I don't consider myself Christian anymore, but I love Jesus and I want to follow him. I'm not a church person, but I follow Jesus. So you hear that a lot, you know. And I have to confess, you know, I get a little defensive <laughs> uh, when I hear these things. And I just, I just want to follow Jesus. Uh, it's just becoming an individualistic thing. You don't need a community. You don't need a theological tradition or help with others or uh, the fellowship of the body of Christ. But this is, we hear this, hear this a lot. Um, and uh, another person you may be familiar with kind of on the same line is Robin Myers. You all know Robin Myers. I got all these books from the library uh, over there. Uh, his title is Saving Jesus from the Church. I'm not sure Jesus needs saving, but anyway, saving Jesus from the church, how to stop worship, how to stop worshiping Christ and following Jesus. So, you know, I know that I know the point he's making, uh, that the people he's speaking just kind of the Christianity that just, okay, you know, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, check that off and go on living. Uh, people who have a kind of a doctrinal idea, but aren't really living lives and following Jesus. So anyway, I understand that, but I don't know. I just wonder, uh, is worshiping Christ and following Jesus, are those mutually exclusive? Uh, uh, I don't think they should be, yeah. Sam. I mean, it just, I guess that's the thing that kind of is a little frustrating to me is that it's, if you look at who do others say that I am and the person with John the Baptist, but John the Baptist was the very person that said, I am coming before the person who I am not worthy to untie his shoes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so John the Baptist knew there was someone other than himself yeah. Yeah. that was coming into the world. And mm -hmm. Elijah foretold what, and there's five, I think it's like 500 years between the Old and the New Testament. Right. So Elijah was like, who knows how much older than John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the thing I don't, it's of trying to put all that together. Right. And can you be mutually exclusive? Can you try to live a good life? Well, sure. I yeah. mean, yeah. I know a lot of people that sure. try to, yeah. and we don't live good lives. I mean, I don't yeah. 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 But it's very, I get really defensive about right. that. And it's, uh, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like that more enlightened people, mm -hmm. you know, like think that they've got it all figured out. I don't think anybody has it all figured out. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I, you know, I agree. I mean, I, I see that, and I say I know where he's coming from, and I appreciate okay. a lot of it. But uh, sometimes it seems like kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. <laughs> you know, I mean, I follow Jesus because I use the Christ. Isn't that uh, anyway? Uh, but this is what we hear this kind of conversation uh, a lot. So. Um, but will anybody anybody else want to uh, anything the things you hear people saying about who Jesus is in, in our day? Uh, so, well, shall we go on then? Uh, I guess this is the place where Jesus, what's that expression, quits preaching and starts meddling? Uh, uh, you know, not just uh, okay. Not, we heard what other people are saying about me, but what what do you say? You know, who do you say uh, that I am? And well, we heard Peter's reply. Peter, I think all the disciples were probably standing there, but Peter, always impulsive, speaks up uh, and he says, You are the Christ. 
So what do you think Peter meant by that? He said, you're the Christ. He had it right. But I think it's possible to have the title right and the meaning wrong. <laughs> so, you know, Peter probably had in mind the traditional view of the Messiah, that they had hoped Jesus was the Messiah who would come triumphantly into Jerusalem and go out the wicked Romans, reestablish the, uh, the kingdom of, of David, and uh, uh, set Israel back uh, uh, in its uh, fulfill the covenant, all these kind of promises to, to, uh, that, uh, that were sort of attached to the, to the coming of, of the Messiah. Um, so uh, 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 it's interesting, though, that everything Jesus said in those succeeding verses uh, uh, not just undermines, but radically contradicts what Peter and probably people traditionally meant by, by the Christ. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, you know, I guess it's easy to get the title right. Uh, you're the Christ, you're a personal savior, you're the savior of the world, whatever title we use, um, uh, which should be right. But how do we understand that? You know, what does that mean? I mean that Jesus is, you know, the answer all our problems, solve every problem, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 you know, we get the title, maybe the easy part, but uh, how do people often misunderstand that? Uh, let's go ahead, Tristan. Well, um, I think that kind of um, keeps me in my head a little bit. Mm -hmm. the, the, like, what does that really mean? And so, um, I have been, I just want to connect this to what's been going on for me in the news this week, which is Alex Jones and the shooting mm -hmm. and um, at Sandy Hook mm -hmm. and the mother um, of, of the six-year-old son who started the cheese love moment. Mm -hmm. To me, that's Jesus right there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she's Christian or not. But if she were to say choose Jesus, I think people would shut down on that minute. <laughs> um, but for her to say choose love in the face of what uh, Alex Jones has said and at about the nine Sandy Hook, that's Jesus. Right. And so I, I don't know uh, what to say about Christ. I was raised Catholic and very ritualistically, but. Um, it's actually choosing love that is hard in moments like that, and that's what Jesus is doing. Yeah, that gets to the heart of a lot of this. Yeah, thank you. Choose, choose love. Um, so when, when you think about that phrase that that you teach children, mm -hmm. Jesus is love. It's just so simple, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like, well, let's just do that. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that because if you just say Jesus, all the politics creates um, separation. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, that's uh, like I say that gets sort of the heart of it. Makes me think about y'all probably heard this. I don't even know if it's true or legend, but Karl Barth was the great theologian was dying, and, and somebody he wrote all these you know dogmatics and he, you know a huge number of books and whatnot. And they said, uh, 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 "What do you had? What do you believe now? If you're dying or something." And he said, "Well, Jesus loves me. This I know." That's a good way to end. So, but uh, so yeah. So that's why you know the the fact that Peter had one probably view of what it meant to be the Messiah, the Christ, is triumphantly going into Jerusalem. And that's why Jesus rebukes him so strongly in a way. You know, you're still on the side of men. You're still thinking in human terms. And um, um, and then uh, it's at that point that Jesus um, uh, gives uh, what, uh, to quote the theme of this class, the radical alternative. Uh, and I don't know what all you are going to talk about the rest of the semester, but it's, it won't, I don't think it'll get any more radical than what Jesus says at this point, um, which is, um, uh, so um, 
He called the multitude and the disciples, and he said to them, if any person, as any person, would come after me, let him or her deny himself, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So Jesus makes uh, whatever we say, whatever title we use, he takes, makes self-denial, uh, denial of self, and cross-bearing the criteria for being his disciple, for following him. So I thought we might want to spend the, the, you know, our last few minutes talking about that a little bit. What? If that's the criteria Jesus says for, what does it mean to deny ourselves? What does self-denial mean, Richard? Can you give us some context? What did cross-bearing mean? Were, were crucifixion common in the day? You know, well, did, did people, were people uh, uh, acquainted with the notion of um, bearing, your, bearing a cross to your own martyrdom? That you, know, you raise the question. I want you. I want us to talk about. There were crucifixions, and uh, yeah, let's, let's, well, but he said, "Take up your cross." Yeah. You know, well, what does that mean? Well, what does that mean to, to the crowd that are following? Him? Yeah. And what does it mean to us? Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. We're gonna go ahead, sir. Um, I really think something that you said, love, love, really is the universal guiding principle for should be. Mm-hmm. I actually think it is. That's why. Right. It is love. Right. Love. right. We deny ourselves, we have an ego. <laughs> and we think about ourselves, every one of us, usually first before anyone else. God said first, God loved me, I mean the parents, and then love everyone else. Mm-hmm. And I believe that what he's saying, and, and Peter, Peter's looking for a world with you. Me, mm-hmm. hey, I want to be here, I want to be one of the big guys right. when we take over. Right. And what he's saying here is deny your own ego. Mm-hmm. Give that up. Love. Remember that taking up the cross is not being crucified. It is denying self and loving everybody mm-hmm. equally. Mm-hmm. And follow me because I'm and follow me. He's God. I mm-hmm. mean, he's the son of son of God's spirit. They're all in one. We are all one. Right. And so Follow me is do that. Love mm-hmm. everyone. So I yeah. think that's basically what he's saying. Yeah, well said. Are you a Calvin scholar? Because <laughs> 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 you know, um, John, we don't talk. To... I think Calvin. I think. Um, yeah. Um, I think when I'm seventy-two now, and when I was in my early twenties, I thought, and I left my body. Oh, wow. And came out. Mm-hmm. I was saved. I mean, I, I, the doctors saved me and I'm fine. But when I left my body, I it changed me. It changed my mm-hmm. life, changed my understanding. And I felt this wonderful, incredible love mm-hmm. and oneness. And that has guided my life ever since. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's beautiful. And, uh... Uh, I was kind of joking about the Calvin, but I, I, I said I said that because uh, John Calvin said denial of self is the sum of the Christian life, and uh, goes on just a sentence or two. He said the principle of self denial has, according to Calvin, two dimensions. The first is the faithful surrender of our of, of of ourselves and what we have to God, love of God, surrendering to God, and secondly, in order to surrender to God's will requires in turn to act in self-denial towards others and act in their best interest. Uh, The latter means putting ourselves and what we have in the service of others. So uh, that's pretty good. I didn't realize that's what it was. This is what I think. You know, uh, some of you probably follow Richard Rohr, founded the Center for Contemplation and Action just down the road from us. But he talks in his book, Immortal Diamond, uh, find that, that we have a false self and a true self. He's not the first to talk about that. We have a false self and a true self. And uh, to, to Jesus and every religious leader uh, uh, 
makes it clear that there's a self that has to be found and, and a self that has to be let go of. And um, uh, Roar goes on, your false self, which you might call your small self, it's your launching pad, your body image, your job, your education, your clothes, your money, your car, your sexual identity, your success, and, and so on. Uh, these are trappings of ego that we use to get through the ordinary day. They're nice enough uh, on their own, but they are largely a projection of our self-image and our attachment to, uh, to it. When you're able to move beyond your false self at the right time in the right way, it will feel precisely as if you have lost nothing. In fact, it will feel like freedom and liberation. When, when you are connected to the whole, you no longer need to protect or defend the mere part. You're now connected to something inexhaustible. The self that must be denied or renounced is that self that separates uh, us as a part, superior, in competition uh, with others. Uh, that kind of uh, letting go of the ego self, which is a lifelong <laughs> process, right? But, but uh, maybe that's part of self-denial. Uh, finding our, our, our true self, our self that's not uh, separate or in competition with others, but that is part of the whole. Uh, so anyway, uh, any other thoughts about you must deny yourself, uh, this egotistic centric self, false self? Um, well, I think that's what, I mean, it seems to me that would be virtually unattainable. I mean, I know many, many people that are magnanimous and they give of themselves and they give of their money and they give of everything. But when it comes right down to it, mm -hmm. you know, would you try to save yourself? Mm -hmm. And I think most of us would. And that's the the height is that Jesus didn't try to save himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's what makes him greater than us, yeah. if you truly can believe that, which I'm not quite sure that I know that now, yeah, that, yeah. you know, yeah. what we read is the case, but I mean, it is, it seems to me, perfection is unattainable. I mean, or, or why would you keep reaching for yeah. it? It's just, and it, I just, for me, I keep thinking, if everybody's level, then that means I mean, it, it's almost like it's the hereafter, too. It's not like right now when I'm consciously alive. Mm -hmm. So I guess when Terrell, when you actually left your body and you felt this complete and total acceptance of love and love, does that mean when Donald Trump dies, is he going to get that same kind of level of love? Mm -hmm. Because I sure don't love him right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't. But we should. Okay. We should. That's Jesus. <laughs> because we are not separate. We may think alike and we, you know, we're perfect unions and so forth. And so we have an affinity for one another and it's easy to accept. It is. That's true. But every person in the world is a child of God. So every person deserves that. And every, there are people who have gone on the wrong path, mm -hmm. but they all. God loves them just the same way that He loves us. Mm -hmm. He 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 the creative, like what they call the creative force. Yeah. Okay. That section. Well, I think that's right. It's uh, but I, I agree with Barry too. It's always we're always struggling all our whole life between this false egotistical self and uh, mm -hmm. and our true self. And uh, that's one reason you know, say who Jesus is for me is is both judge and liberator. Judge in the sense that. Christ's life of perfect love, you know, uh, judges my inability to be as loving, you know, uh, but at the same time, Christ, the grace we receive in Christ, the forgiveness is my liberation. So it's a lifelong journey, <laughs> at least for me. I guess I don't, how then does Satan figure into all of this? I mean, it is, if someone, and apparently some choose to follow a satanic force i mean that's their choice but i do think that makes sense to me that in total god loves us all the same you know it's just i guess it's like your parents love you all the same that they don't i mean it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just because we're human you know yeah. but there's i'll just give a 
tiny example. I love animals, and particularly cats. It's my favorite. <laughs> and I can find a cat anywhere all over the world. It doesn't matter how ugly or whatever. It's not one And I thought to myself, I have an unconditional love for all cats. <laughs> and God has that for all of us. And the cat may be bad and do whatever, and I still love it. And somehow I just love it. And I keep telling myself, I need to love all people. And I have to go and And there are there are evil things that happen in the world. But somehow I know there's another thing. Somehow it there is a reason for it. I believe that God has a reason for it, and we just in our limited understanding don't get it. <laughs> but there but but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> so we're going to run out of time in a minute. I wanted to get back to kind of Richard's point about the other thing you, you just said, uh, uh, in addition to self denial, is cost bearing, mm -hmm. uh, their own cost. And, uh, you know, what does that mean? Uh, uh, I don't, some, I know, I hear people, somebody, uh, say that kind of means, you know, whatever personal suffering we're undergoing. You know, I've got a dippy leg, that's my cross to bear. Or I've got a bad mother in law, that's just my cross to bear. You know, whatever <laughs> kind of suffering. <laughs> but I don't think there is any way to say that suffering is good. As we remember when Jesus' ministry, what did he do? He went about healing people of their suffering wherever he encountered it. So it's not that suffering is good, but. Uh, um, you know, I can take thinking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer when he said, who is Jesus for us today? And his answer, he, Jesus is a Jew because that's where the suffering was. And so he said, we identify our ministry, our mission in terms of the suffering. He, he called it the view from below. And uh, so uh, uh, in a way, cross-bearing, I think, is saying, you know, uh, our calling to... Uh, holding the suffering of the world tenderly and prayerfully, and also deciding, okay, what is my, what is my particular ministry or calling within the world's suffering? And we, we can't do all of it, but each, but following Jesus means that in my place and time, what part of the cross can I pick up? This redemptive love of God through the suffering of the world, uh, which is a totally new way of understanding the Messiah, right? But Anyway, uh, uh, but I don't know if that uh, anybody else want to. And I, I'm sorry I've been ignoring the online people. If, if any of you have a comment or question, please, uh, we'd love to hear it. Anything else about about that, Deborah? I'm thinking about C.S. Lewis actually because he said once that. Anger is what love bleeds when you cut it. Mm -hmm. And I think also love is not a wonderful thing we feel. Uh, this is a cliche, but I think it's true. It's not a wonderful thing we feel. It's a difficult thing we do. Mm -hmm. And I think bearing our crosses means accepting that this will involve actual identification with suffering. It will mean, in fact, the death of the false self. Right. Um, which is a very difficult thing mm -hmm. to do. But I think we, we think that love means, you know, just feeling nice about other people mm -hmm. sometimes instead of the whole difficult but Calvinistic thing about <laughs> judgment and redemption. It's mm -hmm. we don't save ourselves. Right. Yeah. And um, there's, it's the kenosis of Jesus, the empty, mm -hmm. the empty of it was one thing for him to empty himself of his divine nature and die that way. It's not what we're called to. We're called to give us the fallen from of ourselves right. in order to receive what he's offering. Right. And, yeah. yeah, thank you, David. It's beautifully put. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, um, yeah, anyone else? I just uh, uh, had a thought and it left me, but it'll come back. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I was trying to, um, anyway, um, well, y'all, uh, 
any last comments? I wanted to, uh, well, I just emphasize again that uh, I think the importance in the ask who is Jesus Christ today, uh, it, 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 you know, we, we give our answers. He's, he's Christ, he's the Savior, he's the Redeemer of the whole creation, whatever. But the important thing is, is uh, how do we follow Jesus in this life of, of self denial and, and cross bearing? Uh, and it is, it is, it is uh, difficult because uh, there's a sadness in the world. And it means, and I think it means taking on that sadness. Uh, I do like the way Richard Wolf puts it, it's a bright sadness. You know, or what John Cross is a luminous darkness. That yes, it's sad, but we have this this hope. Uh, there is a brightness in it, uh, uh, and uh, a hope, but it's it's difficult and, and rather radical. So, uh, we all want to shall we? I I thought for our uh, just a closing statement um, would use uh, Albert Schweitzer's statement on this is the conclusion of a long book when he's trying to discover the historical quest for the historical Jesus. Who was Jesus? What do we know about him pre-Easter, you know, first century? And uh, so then he, he ends, and you all, I'm, I know some of you are familiar with this. Uh, he comes to us as one unknown, without a name, as of old, by the lakeside. He came to those men who knew him not. He speaks to us the same words, follow me and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill in our time. He commands, and those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. Well, with that note, uh, thank you all so much. I appreciate you all's uh, comments. And uh, I won't say we close, to be continued. But, uh, <laughs> it's a lifelong journey. Thank you. Thank you. Are you here next week, Tuesday? No, I don't, I don't know who's. <laughs> thank you, everybody online. Thank you all. <laughs>